Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us for Managing Caregiver Stress. I'm Calvin with Family Caregiver Alliance, and before we get started, I'd like to say a few words about our organization. Family Caregiver Alliance has been working in the Bay Area and the nation to improve the well-being and the quality of life of family caregivers. We offer support by providing a number of services and resources, including consultations, classes, workshops, publications, and we also do advocacy work both locally and nationally. To learn more about Family Caregiver Alliance, please visit us at caregiver.org. Now, during the webinar, your phones and mics are gonna be muted. So if you have any questions, you can ask them by using the Q&A box on your screen. We will answer as many questions as we can at the end of the webinar. Um, also at the end of the webinar, we're gonna be asking for a little bit of feedback uh, to see how we did. So I'd like to thank you all in advance for filling that out. Today, I'd like to welcome our guests, Jerry Fenter and Helen Bauer. Jerry has more than a decade of history in hospital chaplaincy. He currently works as Systems Director of Spiritual Counselors for Harbor Healthcare System. He holds a BS in Healthcare Management and certificates for both basic and advanced hospice and palliative care chaplaincy from the Institute of Palliative Care at California State University, San Marcos. Jerry is a co-host of the Heart of Hospice podcast. Our second presenter today is Helen Bauer. She has a 30 year history in nursing, specializing in hospice care for over 10 years. She holds a certification in hospice and palliative care nursing and works as an independent hospice consultant. Helen is co-owner of the Heart of Hospice LLC and is one of the hosts of of, the Heart of Hospice podcast, which is committed to enhancing the end of life journey for both consumers and providers of hospice care and supporting anyone experiencing a hospice journey. So now that you know a little bit more about our guests, I'd like to turn things over to Jerry and Helen. Thank you, Calvin. We really appreciate this opportunity to be with the Family Caregiver Alliance. I'm Jerry Fenter, and uh, as Calvin said, I'm the System Director of Spiritual Counselors for Harbor Healthcare System. And I'm Helen Bauer. I'm a registered nurse. I'm a certified hospice and palliative care nurse practicing in the state of Texas. And I am a hospice consultant, private consultant, and I am the co-host of the Heart of Hospice podcast. So we're going to jump on in with our objectives. Calvin, if you'll go ahead and switch to the next slide for me. We've got four objectives today. Um, We hope that you will come away from this webinar learning how to streamline your caregiving tasks. We hope that you will have learned the benefits of creating a caregiving village. Also learn uh, about caring for the caregiver, mind, body, and spirit. We're gonna go into that in detail. And also we hope the participants will learn how to utilize stress management techniques. Okay, Calvin, next slide. So caregiving is a big job. And when we say big, there are over 54 million unpaid caregivers across the United States, according to AARP. These caregivers are hands-on caregivers. They may be live-in caregivers, or they may be remote caregivers living in another city or even another state. Um, Caregivers can become caregivers very suddenly due to an acute event or an emergent situation, or caregivers have a long transition into the caregiving role. And just taking little pieces um, on at a time, and then all of a sudden realizing over these months and years that they have become a full-time caregiver. Next slide. So we wanna give you some tips for managing caregiver stress. And we have some things that we would like to suggest and recommend because we think they are things that would definitely be helpful for you. Next slide. So first and foremost, this sounds very simple, but it's one that's often um, not used like it should be. And that is to just ask for help. So one of the things that we suggest is to make a list of the tasks that you do on a regular basis or even an occasional basis, or maybe they're tasks that you need to do 
but you simply don't have time to do them. Things like grocery shopping or paying bills or yard maintenance, uh, scheduling doctor appointments, cooking meals, uh, laundry, changing sheets. Now, that's just a short list. I'm sure that many of you could come up with a much longer list of things that you have to do as a caregiver. So make out a list, literally write down all these tasks, and then keep the list handy. And I would suggest making more than one copy of the list. And then when someone says to you, well, let me know if there's anything I can do to help, then all you have to do is pull out your list and just say, please pick one. <laughs> and then let them choose something that they can do, something that fits for them. Now, there may be people in your family or in your caregiving network that you need to assign some tasks to. So instead of asking them, you might need to just assign a task for them. But be sure to assign tasks that match with the person's strengths and their talents and their time. For example, no one in my family would ask me to cook them a meal. They know better than that. But they wouldn't hesitate to ask me to mow the yard. I'm happy to do that. So be sure that you assign tasks according to each person's strengths and talents. Now, even remote family members can get involved. They can help by managing online tasks. They don't have to be present with the the patient or the care, the caring, the carer, caree rather, sending out communications is one thing that they could do to the larger group, or even scheduling appointments, doctor appointments, and other appointments and things like that. So, if there's something that they can do as a remote caregiver, assign those tasks to them. So, above all, we want to encourage you to ask for help. Next slide. So the next tip we have also seems a little bit intuitive, but learn all you can about caregiving. This is no time to reinvent the wheel. There are a lot of people, almost 55 million of them across the U.S. doing this unpaid caregiving work. So learn from them. Use the tips and tricks and hacks that other people have developed to help you save time and energy and make the tasks easier. Streamlining the caregiving work helps to reduce your stress, man, your stress that you're experiencing as a caregiver. So we recommend that you utilize caregiving websites like FCA, um, books on caregiving, and even apps on caregiving. There are a lot of apps that are helpful to support caregivers. Ask questions. And this is important because when there's a lot of information coming at you, Healthcare providers have a tendency to use healthcare speak, and sometimes that language isn't clear. And because we as healthcare providers click through the same tasks day after day, we go through them quickly, instruct our patients and families very quickly, and we just assume everybody understands. But that's not always the case. So ask your questions and then repeat them. If you don't understand or you need it to be repeated just because you've got so much information coming at you, go ahead and ask. And then write things down in one central place. We're going to go into that in a lot of detail in just a minute, but it's really important to have things written down because when you're exhausted, scared, grieving, overwhelmed, and busy, then you have those answers written down in one central place where you can just go straight to it. Next slide. So this is something that we really want to emphasize to you is to create a caregiving village. You know, we hear this all the time. You know, the saying is it takes a village. Well, it's true when it comes to caregiving. You shouldn't feel like you're doing this on your own. And there are several advantages to having a caregiving village. It allows other people, first of all, to provide help to your loved one. And many people find there's meaning and purpose that they get by helping others. So by all means, create a caregiving village so that others can actually be a part of caring for your loved one. It also gives you a break so that you don't have to be caregiving 24-7. So 
allow others to come in, create this caregiving village where someone else can take over the duties for a short period of time. It also allows your loved one to interact with others. So that way they feel less isolated and it gives them someone else to share their stories with. You may have heard their stories multiple times, but someone else coming in, well, it gives them a chance to tell the same stories to someone else. Create your caregiving village from a variety of groups. And again, this helps to break the monotony for you and the person that you're caring for. So ask friends, neighbors, uh, family members, volunteers, and even members of the faith community if they will be a part of your caregiving village. And here's something I want to emphasize. Be direct with people. Ask them very directly to be a part of your caregiving village and tell them what you want them to do and how you want them to be a part of this. Don't be shy about this because creating a caregiving village is going to help you be a long-term caregiver if it's necessary. You'll be able to last much longer in this role if you create a caregiving village where you have some help. Next slide. You should also take advantage of services that are offered. There are a lot of things like respite services that are available from hospice, VA, private insurance, Medicaid, uh, even private pay. So ask discharge planners, uh, social workers, uh, or even case managers about services that might be available for you and the person that you're caring for. Most hospices should provide respite services. Respite, respite services for hospice are usually five days and that way it allows the caregiver to have a break from caring for the person that's on hospice. So ask your, if you have a person who's on hospice, ask your hospice agency if they provide respite services, they should. It would be worth finding out if it's available through hospice, either or VA, or it also can be paid for by private insurance or Medicaid. Now, there are other services that are offered, uh, usually community type services that you should engage if you qualify or if it's available. Things like Meals on Wheels, uh, the senior centers who offer many activities, adult daycare, many communities have those available. They're not always free, but they do have adult daycare available in many communities. And there are also support groups for caregivers. And we'll talk more about these support groups a little bit later. Next slide. So let's talk about FMLA. One of the things we know is 60% of unpaid caregivers in the US work outside the home. 60% of them are working a full-time job in addition to being caregivers. So there are certain times when you need to step away from your paid job as a caregiver. So FMLA is the Family Medical Leave Act. It's um, a resource that a caregiver can use if they qualify. So Family Medical Leave Act provides certain employees with up to 12 weeks of unpaid job protected leave per year. And I want to emphasize the unpaid job protected aspects of FMLA. So there wouldn't be a, a payment, no salary during that time period, and you are guaranteed a job, but not your particular job that you are currently in. It does require that group health benefits be maintained during your family medical leave act, family medical leave that you take, so you don't lose your health benefits. And FMLA applies to all public agency agencies. That includes public and private elementary and secondary schools and companies with 50 or more employees. So if you work for a small business, you may not have access to FMLA. It does provide eligible employees with up to 12 weeks of unpaid leave each year for an immediate family member with a serious health condition, as well as other reasons for our purposes here. I, I haven't listed all of them. Um, it's super important that you check out FMLA criteria before a crisis occurs. If there is an acute event or something emergent that happens, it's very difficult to scramble to communicate 
with your employer, figure out if you qualify for FMLA, and then fill out the paperwork that goes with it because there is a process to accessing FMLA. So always a good idea to find out what your options are and if the the company that you work for um, actually has FMLA, provides FMLA for you. Next slide. We really want to emphasize too that technology can make caregiving easier for you. So use the available technology. Most everyone has a smartphone anymore and most smartphones have a video chat feature. So make the technology work for you. It's supposed to save us time and energy. Let's make it work in our favor. So smartphones can help. You can feel you and your person that you're caring for can feel less isolated by connecting with friends and family. And it may be something as simple as a phone call, but if you really want to make a good connection, maybe use the video chat feature like FaceTime on any Apple product, or there are other features such as Skype that can be used on any device. So that allows you to see the other person. And if you're a remote caregiver, someone who's not actually with the person that you're caring for, you live at a distance, then using video chat can really be helpful to provide a, a visual assessment of your person and their living situation. So Helen, I want to ask you something. Uh, if you're using video chat to kind of check in on the person you're, you're caring for from a distance, what are some things you want to look for? You're, you're a nurse, so you kind of have this eye for things and you know what to look for. So what are some things you want to look for about their living situation or about them? I think using video chat with your person that you're providing care for remotely is a great tool, especially with the times that we've been through through the pandemic. We've learned that this can be really useful. You know, it's good to see if your loved one is wearing clean clothes, if they look like they're managing their personal hygiene okay, is their hair brushed, um, are they wearing the glasses they typically wear, or is there any indication that they may have trouble managing their activities of daily living? You can also look at the living environment. Um, does it look like dishes are piling up in the kitchen, like they haven't been able to manage the, the household um, chores around the house, but you can also look at their facial expressions and if there's any bruising on the face, you know, things like that, you can look and see if they're having any tremors. Um, and I'm a big fan of being able to read visual cues and facial expressions. So I think having that video capability as a caregiver can be really important, especially a remote caregiver from a very long distance, because it's, hard to assess, you know, whether extra help is needed when you're just going by phone. I think a video can be really useful. Good. Well, that's really good tips. Thank you. So most devices, phones, as well as your other devices have conference call features and it works for voice or video too, so that you can talk to your caregiving team all at the same time. So maybe there's something that you need to share information with everyone in the family or everyone in a caregiving team. Well, rather than making one phone call for each person that you need to talk to, you can actually do a conference call. That way you can tell everyone at the same time. If anyone has any questions, they can ask their questions that at that point and everybody hears. And so there's not any, well, I, I, sh I should have told you this, but I didn't tell this person this. It creates a lot less confusion. That way, everyone gets the same information at the same time. And by all means, it reduces the number of calls. It's especially helpful when a decision needs to be made. So again, having everyone on the same call at the same time, helping to make the decision, it's just so much easier to do it. So telehealth services are also something that's become more prominent lately and I encourage you to use telehealth services when you can. Your healthcare providers may often actually offer telehealth services for you. Use those services. That way you don't have to be inside of a, a waiting room with the chances of infections and things like that, or having to pack everything up and travel to the doctor. Sometimes it's very difficult for the person that we're caring for to have mobile, uh, to be mobile and move around 
because there's so much that has to go into that. So using telehealth can be a very advantageous way to get the answers that you need and to get the help that you need and get answers quickly and efficiently. Next slide. Okay, this is my all time favorite thing. I know. Keeping a care journal. I have used this personally for my husband's family, for my father in law. A care journal is an awesome way of managing what's going on. It becomes sort of your, your memory, <laughs> it keeps things for you. So it's a great idea to keep a care journal where you're writing down daily activities. It can include everything from how much was emptied out of a catheter. Um, changes in condition, appointments that the patient or, or the loved one, your loved one has gone to, any visits that have been made into the home from therapies or home health, things like that. Uh, keeping a care journal helps others who are part of the caregiving village. So instead of having to recall all that information for somebody else who may have come into the home to help out, they can look at this and say, oh, you know, dad had this medicine at this point. Um, it also assists professional caregivers. They're going to ask you, as a former home health nurse and a current hospice nurse, we're always going to ask about what's been going on since the last visit. When was the last bowel movement? When did, how many times have you given pain medications? Um, you know, what happened when he fell? Things like that. Um, and so it's great to have that written in a care journal. It's got a timeline there and it streams out and streamlines a lot of things when it comes to professional caregivers who are in your home. It also assists with management of a crisis when things are hectic because things get hectic. Changes are frequent. Um, life gets demanding and messy. Let's just put it that way. Um, and it's also certainly acceptable to use a pre-printed form. Um, one of the ones that I personally like is from BK Books. It's a great booklet called By Your Side, but you can use something as simple as a spiral notebook. With my father-in-law, we, we really literally had a spiral notebook on the kitchen table, which was very close to where his bed was. And we had a pen there and each of us would make an entry. And it's really important that you, you include a date and a time. And if you are coordinating care with somebody, especially your healthcare provider, um, home health nurse, physician or nurse practitioner, you want to make sure that you're writing down the names of the people that you're speaking with. Um, if you're coordinating resources, community resources, Meals on Wheels, or talking with an insurance company about benefits, it's important to document, basically, is what you're doing in a care journal, the date and time that you spoke with them, and the name that of the person that you spoke with, so that when you need to go back and get it, here's your memory being kept for you in this book, and you don't have to hold on to so many little, little pieces of information. It can be really challenging. Next slide. Okay, one of the things we want to bring up at this point too is advanced care plans. So you wanna talk about advanced care plans, not only for your loved one, the person that you're taking care of, you need to talk about advanced care plans for yourself because studies have shown that caregivers, due to the stress of a caregiving situation, often are the ones who lose their health, their health quicker than even the person they're taking care of. So you need to have advanced care plans in place for yourself just as much as you need them for your loved one, the person that you're taking care of. So advanced care plans are important because it ensures that your health care wishes are going to be followed. If you're not able to tell someone what your health care wishes are, then you need to have advanced care plans in place so that someone else, your chosen proxy, can tell them this is what this person wants. Now, fewer than 50% of severely ill or even terminally ill patients had an advanced directive. Fewer than 50%. That's not a good number. In fact, only about half of the population over 60 has an advanced directive. That's not very good either. So there are many reasons to have an advanced care plan. Well, first of all, it eliminates unwanted treatments. There may be certain things that your loved one or you don't want to have done. 
then you need to make sure that you have these advanced care plans put in place so that your healthcare wishes are known. It also avoids costly procedures or procedures that have little to no success. You need to know that the success rate of CPR is about 12% for cardiac arrest outside the hospital. So you need to know what you want. Do you want CPR? Do you not want CPR? What things do you want them to do? So documenting your healthcare wishes really makes it easier on you and your family. But Helen, it's not just about healthcare too. It's not just about the the healthcare things, the, the medical things. There's also advanced care plans that need to be put in place about other things. Right, right. If you're a caregiver for a loved one, um, you need to talk to the caregiving village, to your family, to, to designate who would be responsible for the caregiving duties, who would take on that primary caregiver role if something should happen to you as a caregiver. You would also want to include, you know, where would you want to be cared for? And who would you want to do that with you? Um, Because that can be a very personal, very intimate decision. And there have been situations that I've seen as a nurse where the caregiver actually becomes the one who needs the care and needs a primary caregiver. Um, And there's so many different things, different types of healthcare wishes based on your religious and your cultural beliefs and your just your personal preferences. And then funeral disposition of the body. So advanced care planning really covers a really broad range. The healthcare piece of it's just one small piece. Right. So it's not just the medical piece that needs to be done. That's probably the priority, but it's certainly not all of it. There's many other pieces that need to be taken care of too. So when you think about advanced care plans, don't just think about the medical side of it. Think about all the other things that also might need to be put in place. Right. Next slide. Okay. So we're going to bring this up now to talk about your own health care needs. You, you as the caregiver, need to keep up with your own health needs. And so we're going to divide this into three parts. We're going to talk about self-care for your mind, self-care for your body, and self-care for your spirit. So let's start off with self-care for your mind. Go ahead and change to the next slide, please. You want to take care of your mental health. So the demand for mental health care has increased during the pandemic. We're not surprised by that. In fact, referrals for mental health treatment have increased by 25% since the pandemic started. And according to the American Psychological Association, 68% of psychologists report having a wait list now. So it's really important if you're gonna take care of your, your mental health to avoid becoming isolated, maintain your relationships. Again, use the technology, stay connected with others, even if it's just making a phone call. Sometimes it's important to make a phone call to the same person at the same time every day. Hey, I'm just checking in. I want you to know that everything's okay here and how are things with you? So use that technology. And sometimes the best way to use technology is actually to step away from it. So disconnect from those electronic devices. Step away from Facebook and social media and all the other things and do some electronic fasting. It can really be helpful for your mental health. It's important to be self-aware too. Watch yourself for signs and symptoms of depression or grief or even anxiety. And it's important that you understand yourself, know when things are happening in you and take steps immediately to do something about it. So one of the things that we'd like to recommend is meditation or something known as tapping. Uh, Tapping is also known as EFT, which stands for Emotional Freedom Technique. Now, Proponents say that tapping helps to access the body's energy and send signals to the part of the brain that controls stress. This is actually based on Chinese medicine, and it's thought that stimulating various points on the body through tapping can reduce stress or negative emotions, and it ultimately restores balance to the disrupted energy that's caused by anxiety. So you might want to do some research on that, but that's certainly one way of helping you with your mental health. Next slide. Okay. 
self-care for your body. Find ways to move. And I know the first thing that comes to your mind is ugh, exercise, working out, people making me run, that sort of thing. And that's not necessarily what's needed. There are ways to move, uh, stretching, walking, even small increments of exercise movement are beneficial. Um, it reduces the risk of depression. And you want to start low and slow with approval from your doctor. So when I say start low, that means low exertion and low impact. And slow means short time interval intervals that can increase. It helps to prevent energy uh, injuries and helps create consistent movement habits. Of course, if you don't like it, change to something you prefer, because if you don't like it, you won't keep it up. Habitual exercise, habitual movement is the most beneficial for you. Practice good sleep hygiene. When I say good sleep hygiene, that means going to bed at the same time each night if you can, and getting up at the same time each morning if you can. Creating a room that's comfortable to sleep in, a cool room with um, the lights out, and of course, no devices. Limit your screen time, including TV, phones, other mobile devices or tablets, usually about an hour to two hours prior to going to sleep. Helps you to get to sleep and prevents insomnia. Watch what you eat and drink. Of course, that makes sense. But you need to remember that food and alcohol and caffeine can influence not only, not only your energy level, but your mood and your overall health. And then take your meds or supplements consistently. Remember, this is one of those oxygen mask situations. You put your oxygen mask on first before you can help someone else. So as a caregiver, one of your responsibilities to be a good caregiver is to take care of yourself. It's hard to remember to do that when you have to prioritize what you're doing, but taking your meds or your supplements consistently is really important. Next slide. Practice aromatherapy. So this is an easy one. It really doesn't take a lot of work. You can use a diffuser in your home where you place some, uh, put some essential oils in a diffuser and it doesn't um, leave moisture in the home, but it diffuses a scent that can be very healthy and healing. Or you can put a scented bath bomb in the tub or the shower. And of course, we say in the tub, like people have time to luxuriate in a, a long soaking time in the tub, but more than likely you don't have time to do that as a caregiver. So putting a bath bomb on the floor of the shower is a great way to release those essential oils and to breathe that in. Um, certain essential oils are great for anxiety and relaxation. Some are good for immunity and sleep or um, for respiratory health as well. You can also use roll-on oils, essential oils that way to place some on the skin. And again, you can get those, those benefits through aromatherapy. Utilize massage, either professional or self-massage. There are great videos on YouTube online where you can look and see how to utilize tennis balls or foam rollers to ease the tension in your shoulders and your back and your neck. For those of us who don't have time or the access or the money for um, going to an appointment with a massage therapist, you can do it yourself. You can get a chiropractic adjustment if that is something that um, appeals to you. If you have access to that, chiropractic adjustment can affect a lot of the different body systems, can be very beneficial. Also, acupuncture and acupressure are some great modalities for taking care of your body, relieving stress, relieving muscle tension, um, pain, back issues, and your chiropractor might be the practitioner to um, provide you with those services. Keep your medical, dental, and vision appointments up to date. Remember, this goes back to you putting on your mask first as a caregiver before you help somebody else. And so here's a really important one. Tell your healthcare provider that you're a caregiver. That might not sound like a big deal, but it's important. So say you have a job where you are an airline pilot for a commercial airline. You're going to tell your eye doctor, I fly for a living. This is what I do for a living. He's going to make sure you have a thorough exam. 
He's going to talk to you about your eye health and what you need to do to support it. So caregiving is the same way. This is your job. When you go in, you want to tell your nurse practitioner, your physician, your healthcare team, I am a caregiver. I work outside my home, maybe, but I am also a caregiver for a loved one who has dementia or Parkinson's. I do a lot of physical caregiving. It's really important that your healthcare provider knows this so that they can customize the care that they're providing for you to the demands of your caregiving job, because it is a caregiving, it is a job. And then lastly, listen to what your body is telling you. Your body sends you signals, muscle tension, headaches, pain, anxiety, even chest pain, various different manifestations physically. So listen to what your body is telling you. Next slide. Okay, so we've looked at self-care for your mind. We've looked at self-care for your body. So now we want to talk about self-care for your spirit. One tip that we would suggest is to find someone to talk to. Many times caregivers find themselves isolated and feeling lonely. It's important to have that person to talk to. We've mentioned this several times during this presentation already, and we're going to mention it again because it's that important. Find someone to talk to, maybe just a friend, or maybe what you really need is a counselor or a mental health professional, somebody who can be there for you and who has the, the education and experience to help you in some very meaningful ways. Or maybe your faith leader is someone that you can talk to. Make a regular appointment with them, even if it's just by phone, but make an appointment to talk to them on a regular basis. It's important to do that. And it's good self-care for your spirit to have someone that you can share your struggles with, your challenges with, and let them know how things are going. We'd encourage you to continue your worship habits. So one of the things that's happened during the pandemic is that many churches realized, many faith communities realized that they needed to provide virtual services for people who couldn't come to church, who couldn't come to the, the actual place of worship. So you can actually still have that experience even at home through a virtual experience at worship. So continue your worship habits. Continue, if you can, your activities in the faith community, if your caregiving experience will allow that. So maybe you sing in the choir. Uh, maybe you are, are another, uh, for instance, a Sunday school teacher. Continue those things if you can. It's important to do that. Continue your faith rituals. Whatever your faith rituals might be, continue to do that for your own self-care for your spirit. Practice some creative activities too, things that you like to do. Whatever hobbies that you had been doing that you enjoy doing, try to keep that up. Whether it's uh, knitting or whether it's crochet, whether it's sewing, whether it's making things out of wood, doing woodworking, whatever it is, even if you can only do it in small increments, maybe 30 minutes at a time, do those things because it can be very beneficial for your spiritual well being. Things like writing, reading, painting, journaling, cooking, singing. Do those things that give you a lift, things that encourage you in your spirit. Next slide. We want to encourage you to spend time outside. And yes, that can be self-care for your spirit. It can also be good for you mentally and physically because sunlight actually can enhance the vitamin D levels that your body needs. And there's some mental and emotional benefits to that. How about listening and creating music? Music is so helpful and so beneficial for us in our spirits, whether it's singing, banging on drums, dancing, or even conducting your own imaginary band, whatever it is that you want to do. Make it, make it helpful. Make it happy for you. We would also encourage you to have a gratitude list. So at the end of the day, list three things that you got right. What did you do right today? It can be just simple things, small wins. I, I did the dishes today. I got all the, the laundry done. I got out of my pajamas today. <laughs> okay, so those are small wins. And start a gratitude practice. List three things every day that you're grateful for. So I'll tell you, studies have actually shown that having a gratitude practice 
actually benefits your mental and emotional health. And I would even say your spiritual health. And finally, take a mini retreat. Okay, so a mini retreat might be something that you do for an hour in the afternoon. Or if you are able to do it, maybe an entire day or even an entire weekend. Okay, then I would refer you back to the respite services that we talked about earlier. If it's necessary, find a respite service or find someone in your caregiving village who can come by and stay with the person you're caring for for an hour or for a day or for a weekend. But find some time for you and take a mini retreat. Next slide. Okay, now we're going to touch on some of the stress management techniques. We've been talking a lot about streamlining, streamlining and making the caregiving job easier. And now we're going to talk about some specific stress management techniques. Next slide. Okay, this is one of my favorites because it costs nothing. You're already doing it anyway. You can do it anywhere you want to. Deep breathing. An inhale of six counts, hold for six counts, and exhale for six counts. You can do this whenever you feel overwhelmed or anxious or exhausted or tense. Um, when you can feel yourself, your, your patients running thin with your loved one. Um, and literally, anywhere you need to, anywhere you need to. It's a great meditative stress reliever. Stretching is also good. There are so many different stretches that you can do that aren't strenuous. You can do them sitting from your chair. Um, you can do them in the car. You can do it at work if you need to. But stretching is a great way to, to re reduce anxiety and reduce stress. And if you pair it with the deep breathing, it's a really good combination. Meditation, also a really good one. Now, that's a skill that you have to work on, but even short intervals of meditation can be beneficial. And I'm talking like five minutes can be very beneficial. Um, reading aloud from a favorite book, even a children's book is a stress management technique. And, and I think in its own way, that's a little bit meditative. Um, yoga, definitely meditative as well. Great for reducing stress. And again, you don't have to be a yoga master, a yogi, you can do it to whatever your capabilities are, whatever your physical and, and time capabilities are. Next slide. Tai Chi. So the slow meditative movement of Tai Chi can be adapted to the caregiver's ability and also can be done anywhere. Again, think um, sit and be fit, which is a great exercise program, but it's all done from someone, uh, from the perspective of someone who has to be seated. So Tai Chi is great. Guided imagery. Guided imagery is um, a meditative practice where there is there are words that guide you to create certain thoughts or a picture to take you to a safe place. Um, there are apps that have guided imagery that you can listen to, and there are um, there are YouTube videos available as well, and that's a great stress manager. So here's another one that I really like, chanting or repeating a mantra, because again, you can do this anywhere. You can do this anywhere. Um, and of course, you probably want to do it in a place where you may have a little bit of privacy, a little bit of quiet. Using comfort words or phrases can be really good at reducing tension, reducing anxiety. Things like, I am safe, I am loved, I am strong, and just repeating that. Or a string of good words that have meaning for you, strength, courage, love, healing, and capable. That's a great set of words for reminding you who you are and what you can do and the strengths that you have. Or happy, healthy, meaning, love, gratitude, and grace. For a lot of people, this is a way of manifesting out loud the emotions and thoughts and um, I guess, aura that they want to have, this mindset that they want to create. But bear in mind that you want to use stress management techniques that you like, that are sustainable for you. 
because we know that if it's something we really don't like and we feel like we're forcing it, you know, square peg, round hole, we're not going to continue it. And consistency and being persistent in your your self-care and your stress management techniques, that's the way to do caregiving for the long haul to take the best care of yourself and the person you're taking care of. Next slide. So one of the things that you can do that would really help too is to always remember that you need to be an advocate, not only for your loved one, but also for yourself. And that means that sometimes you're going to have to set boundaries with other people and perhaps even with the person you're caring for, your loved one. So it's an activity. You need to, to set boundaries with others for your time and activity uh, because otherwise you can get overwhelmed. So to relieve caregiver stress, having boundaries is really important. And it also means setting boundaries with your loved one. You know, we know that not every relationship works in a healthy way. Let's be realistic here. And it's easy in a caregiving situation for boundaries to get blurred or to become non-existent. So it's important that you, as a caregiver, set boundaries with your loved one about what you can do and what you can't do. Now, it's important to be very clear in your communication. So use great communication skills, be direct. But being direct doesn't mean you need to be unkind, right? So be direct, but open and honest. Be timely with it. So don't try to talk about these things when you're tired or they're tired. Find the right time to bring up these, these situations and the needs that are there. Always, always, always be respectful, but be an advocate for yourself. And that means having boundaries. And by doing that, you can reduce some of the stress. It's also important that you connect with other caregivers. Next slide, please. Connect with other caregivers. Find other caregivers who are doing what you do. You know, caregiving has unique challenges and not every caregiving situation is going to be the same. Your circumstances may feel different than anything that anyone else is doing. We know that for those who are caregivers, for someone with dementia, that's really challenging. It has many challenges and it would be good to connect with caregivers who have been through what you're going through, who are going through even the same experiences right now. And it helps to have someone you can ask questions about the changes and the challenges and the ways to cope with grief and overwhelm. So connect with other caregivers. And it reduces the feeling that there's no one else out there who understands what you're doing. When really there are, there's 54 million other caregivers out there who understand. So connect with other caregivers. So I would want to focus on the dementia aspect for just a minute. Sure. Because dementia can be one of those challenging situations that really is very unique, even inside the dementia diagnosis. When you're talking about Louis, Louis body dementia or frontal lobe dementia, you know, there's so many different variables. And I think there's also a great deal of isolation that comes with that because when behaviors change and speech changes, um, belligerence may be an issue, sundowning behavior becomes an issue. I think caregivers are forced in a lot of situations to become more isolated with their loved one um, out of maybe embarrassment. You know, maybe mom or dad has a tendency to rattle off a bunch of four letter words where that was not their character before, or they do it in inappropriate places where it's offensive. Or mom has a tendency to take her clothes off. Or you have someone who doesn't like to be touched. And so social situations or being out in public can be a big challenge. Um, and I think those caregiving situations become very delicate and very individualized. So it's important to find other caregivers as best you can, even again, like Jerry was saying, to connect with somebody by phone. If you can't go to a support group, um, you know, a lot of our caregivers are out in, out in rural areas and they don't have access to that kind of support, those kinds of groups. But to connect with somebody else who says, I have walked this exact same journey. I understand what you're saying. 
I, I really understand it. So it's a good idea to connect with somebody else. Right. And there are many good online forums out there that you could you could use as well. So that's really important. Next slide. As we start to close, we want to encourage you with these last few thoughts. Most importantly, practice self-forgiveness. You're human. You're going to make mistakes. And so we want to encourage you, be gentle with yourself. Offer yourself grace and be patient with yourself. You can't be superhuman. There's, there's no such thing as Superman. And you can't do this alone either. So when you make a mistake, and you will, just forgive yourself, be gentle, and move on. Next slide. We've got a list here for you. Obviously, we've got some great resources. Family Caregiver Alliance is at the top of the list. And you'll see our organization as well, theheartofhospice.com. Um, so your each website's listed there for you to access, and hopefully you get some benefit from that. So we'll turn it back over to Calvin now. Thanks, Calvin. Great. Thank you both. We do have lots and lots of questions. I wanted to um, get right into it. Thanks for sharing so much information with us. The, the first question is a caregiver who would like to know if any caregiving tasks are appropriate for, say, a 10-year-old. And if so, should these tasks be optional or be assigned like chores? What are your thoughts on that idea? I, I think that's a great idea. This is a really good question because a lot of times if you have a person who's needing care living inside your home, you may have a multi-generational household, which is fantastic. Imagine being able to create a caregiving village that includes the presence of a younger person, teaches them responsibility, teaches them family engagement. And also I think there's some social, psychosocial benefits to a younger person, a child having interaction with somebody who is not in great health or is older. So yes, I think that that would be great to incorporate um, a younger person, even as young as 10. Now they need to be age appropriate tasks, obviously, not be on their physical capabilities or their emotional and mental capabilities no med administration, things like that. But yeah, I think there would be a lot of benefits to, to incorporating some age appropriate caregiving tasks. Thank you. Um, we have another question that's been asked a bunch, but I can actually answer this. They wanted to know if there's gonna be a recording and yes, there will be, we'll get this up on our, um, our YouTube channel and our webpage, but I'll, I'll push that out to everybody who's registered. We have another question from a caregiver who wants to know, about how to convince a the person they're caring for to accept help um, sounds like more like a paid a paid caregiver versus maybe um, um, like a family or friend but how to convince um, the person receiving care to accept some paid help so that the caregiver themselves can get a little um, assistance and take a little bit of um, weight off their load so I can answer this from personal experience. <laughs> this is like the million dollar question. <laughs> right. Um, it's, it really can be a challenge to do that. So what we need to do is, first of all, understand that the person that is needing care wants to be as independent as they can for as long as they can. And we need to respect that. They want to be able to, to take care of themselves but we know from watching them that they need help for their activities of daily living, for instance. They might need help with their personal hygiene. And so what we would recommend is that, as always, we're going to say this again, you start low and slow. So start with small incremental changes that could help them. Uh, maybe encourage them to let someone come in and clean the house for them. Just start there. What's one thing that they would like help with? Uh, begin at that point and then begin to add services that they will need as time goes by. But sometimes it has to be done slowly and just incrementally. That's the best way to do it. I would also add to always include an out. So 
tell them, okay, so we're going to have uh, 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 somebody to come in and clean the house. We'll give them a try this time. And if you don't like it, we'll try someone else. So to always give them an option, it feels more like a choice and less like um, a stealing of their independence. That's a good question. Thank you. We have another que- um, another um, caregiver who wants to know if you might be able to recommend any particular caregiving apps um, and their own question specifically would be an app that would be able to identify a support team. And once you're able to create that team to allow messaging to occur between all party members and also to be able to assign everybody tasks. Ooh. There are several that allow for multiple users. There are several. Um, I'm going from memory. Caring Village is one. Mm -hmm. Caring Village is one. Um, Oh, Caring Bridge is another. Caring Bridge. Yeah, Caring Village is one that I have actually used with my family. I have a 95-year-old dad uh, who still lives at home. And we try to keep tabs on how things are going, how his health is through the Caring Village app. And so that would be one that actually works very well. Um, And there are are free versions of that app. And I think there are also paid versions that give you further features if you want them and need them. I would recommend going into the App Store and searching, just typing in caregiving and see what comes up because there are numerous ones. Um, There's so many different ones and you wanna find one, there's one called Caregiver Go. Um, There's so many different ones and you wanna find one that's appropriate and fits your group. Not everybody is super technical savvy. So simplicity can be really important, but yeah, there are several different ones available. Thanks. Uh, We have a question now about the, um, I guess, creating the caregiver village. This is a caregiver who is trying to get support, but doesn't have any support from family or friends. So assuming that maybe they've tried earnestly and just the family and friends are just not at all willing. You mentioned that one possibility is to find volunteers or maybe to go into other, you know, communities, maybe if you're part of a faith community. Do you have any recommendations maybe to kind of do this kind of quote unquote, maybe like a cold from almost like cold calling, how to, how one might find volunteers, people who, you know, you don't necessarily have any personal connection to, to assist with your uh, caregiving um, village. That's a challenge. That's a very good question. It's a good question. So there are usually some aging services that are available in every community, just about, uh, uh, I would I would encourage you to find those services that are there. They often know of people who are volunteers um, and always encourage you to check with some of your faith communities. They are a good resource for volunteers as well. Um, whether it be, you know, whatever your religious background might be, check with your church, your synagogue, uh, parish, whoever uh, and find out if there aren't some people who would be willing to volunteer as part of your caregiving village. Okay, great. I think we have time for just one more quick question. This is from a caregiver who wants to know maybe some um, strategies or tips on how to address conflicts that may arise between family members who are sharing caregiving responsibilities. Ooh, that's like winning the lottery. (laughs) Um, So this is doable. This is doable. The first thing I would tell you is that the caregiving job involves grief and everybody grieves a little bit differently. So we all have a different idea of how caregiving jobs should be done for someone. So first of all, practice patience and tolerance. And then I would, if it's possible, to designate one person who is the most hands-on caregiver, the person who has the most contact, the most present in the ho- presence in the home, to sort of be the lead, if that's possible. 
and then let them be the hub from where everything else goes. Asks people, ask people to do tasks according to their strengths and their time availability, but it is very challenging. I would recommend that you get maybe um, a social worker involved to help because, for instance, hospice social workers and home health social workers and palliative care social workers can help with family conferences. And a lot of times that those disagreements can be worked out and then caregiving tasks can be assigned as people I think it's important for people to realize the value that they bring to a caregiving situation, regardless of the task that they do. So you have to be patient, have those conversations, and try to recognize each person's importance. But maybe the presence of a neutral mediator, like a social worker or a case manager, might be helpful to help resolve some of those differences. I would add in that we should always be willing to compromise know that there are some things that we can compromise on, but we also need to understand that there are things that we're not going to compromise on, that they are priority for the the person we're caring for, maybe because it was a priority to that person. You know, what were their healthcare wishes? We're going to honor their healthcare wishes. That's something we're not going to compromise, but we'll always be willing to compromise where compromise is necessary or is possible. Um, so it, it's always challenging, but it, it is doable. Thank you both. Well, I just wanted to, um, again, thank both um, Jerry and Helen. They've been with us before, so we're really happy to have them come on again and share their expertise with everyone um, and all their, their knowledge. And of course, we want to thank you all for joining us today. Um, these Family Caregiver Alliance webinars, they're free. They are a continuing series. You can find out about our next webinar on our website, which is caregiver.org. And um, again, thanks. um, Thank you, Jerry and Helen, for joining us today. Thank you so much, Calvin. Happy to be here. For now, I think that's the end of this webinar. We are very grateful you spent your time with us. And we hope to see you back um, next month. So please take care. So thank you again. And um, thank you again, um, Jerry and Helen.